To Lebanon, I went to better understand war. For 15 years, from 1975 to 1990, civil war had ravaged Lebanon, a war whose impact can still be felt and seen to this day. Remember what we talked about before, 1975. The UN passed a um, resolution decreeing something. And then in 1991, it was uh, revoked. And you got to kind of ask yourself why. Who has the strength? Who has the power? Who has the money? How do wars happen? Who chooses who gets killed? Who chooses who survives? Back to the war in Lebanon. It was not only this war, but the wars of this often, un mis often misunderstood region that I wanted to understand. How they start and how, if or when, they will end. From Lebanon, Syria was only a nation away. Until 1918, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the end of the war to end all wars, Lebanon was part of greater Syria. Then, England divided the world, forever altering, altering the borders of the Levant and the ways in which the world was occupied. The ways in which the world was occupied. By 2017, the war in Syria had been raging for seven years with still no end in sight. It has been estimated that 500,000 Syrians have been killed since the conflict began and that over 11 million Syrians have fled their country to their surrounding neighbors of Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and Iraq, making a region not known for its stability even more unstable. Until the war began in Syria, most of the refugees who had arrived in Lebanon had been from Palestine, expelled as they were from their homes and their land almost 70 years before when the state of Israel was created and the land of Palestine was slowly destroyed. But now almost a decade into the conflict that shows no signs of stopping, almost 1 million Syrians have fled, flooded across the Lebanese border, crowding an already crowded country. But with war seething throughout their land, where else are they to go? What remained of May was spent volunteering at a school in Shatila, Shatila, Shatila for Syrian children. Since 1949, Shatila had been the home of Palestinian refugees forced out of their homes and country almost 70 years before. It measures one square kilometer until a war, and until war erupted in Syria, it housed almost 10,000 Palestinian refugees. Since the Syrian war began, that number has swelled to an estimated 22,000 refugees. So many people, too many people for so small a space. Each morning, just before nine, Eleanor, a journalist from Belgium, and I walked down the highway to flag a van as it passed. After slamming the sliding door shut, we drove from one side of the city to the other, stopping just outside of the gates of Shatilla. Once out of the van, we added layers to our clothing, rolling down, rolled down the legs of our pants, and covered our shoulders and arms out of respect for religion that was not ours. And then we entered Shatilla. Those first few days, I felt like an intruder trespassing somewhere I did not belong. Who was I to come and go freely when others would give, have given their lives for this freedom? Although it had not rained, water flooded the streets and dirt collected in the middle of the road. The sewer system was not designed to accommodate so many occupants within these crowded confines. Left wanting in the years after the war, Lebanon is not celebrated for its infrastructure. Rather, it laments in its lack thereof. Ever aware, Eleanor said this happens often, too often really, and we skirted around the edges of the puddle, careful where we stepped. Above us, wires tangled and suspended were strung across the narrow streets, a canopy of electricity, a cover of darkness meant to provide light. In every alleyway hung posters of the resistance, Palestinian flags and photographs of Yasser Arafat. This is how we knew to find ourselves in uh, to find the otherwise unmarked entrance. The school in which we taught shares the building with Medicine Sans San, Medicine San Frontier, Frontier. Sorry. I'm still learning to speak English. As we climbed the crowded stairs to the second floor, we passed young mothers who rocked their sleeping children in their arms. In the flickering light, I did not know whether to smile or to move to in, in silence, knowing that to play either the spectator, spectator or the specter made me complicit in what I was now witnessing. The long-term effects of gross violations of human rights. The long-term effects of gross violations of human rights. Shatila. Maybe you can look up what happened in 1983 there. It was 1982. Sabra and Chatilla. See. See what you learn. Upstairs, the school is no more than four rooms filled with plastic tables and chairs. The children, the living casualties of war, were all under the age of 11, with the youngest having just turned five years old. Normally, I am against voluntourism, knowing 
from experience that it does more harm than good. But so torn had I become doing nothing and doing something that I chose this. I chose hope. Days passed and we began to recognize the people who lived and worked in Chatilla. A smile was offered here, a nod of the head there. These have always been my favorite ways to say hello. In the break between morning and afternoon classes, we took coffee with Mahmoud, a Palestinian whose family was, has now been here for a generation. Between us, we did not share enough words in the same language, but still we sat, he behind the counter and us in front, drinking strong cups of Arabic coffee. To pass the time, he offered us cigarettes rolling them in his fingers, twisting one end and lighting the other. On the screen of his phone, there was a photograph of his future bride. She is as beautiful as he is, with eyes just as green and a smile that speaks of hidden joys that neither time nor distance nor displacement can strip from her. When the time came for us, for us to return from school, wait, when the time came for us to return to school, we paid for our coffees and said, till our tomorrows. After class, we walked down narrow streets colored with watermelon and tomatoes and crowded with the ringing of bicycle bells and the slow moan of car horns. On our left was a butcher's shop. Inside, there were no customers and the room was empty, save for meat that hung from hooks along the wall. The butcher stood in the corner, his body a silhouette. In his hands, he held the clarinet, caressing the bell in the barrel gently with his fingers. Alone with his instrument, he closed his eyes and brought the reed to his already pursed lips. Taking a deep breath, he sighed into the instrument, his exhalations transforming into a melody neither Eleanor nor I had ever heard. But still we listened as he moved his fingers over, his, over the keys and his body swayed slowly, as if tired of motion yet longing to move freely. We walked on, unwilling to intrude on this ever-shifting peace. From the door of an open bakery, and drifted the sweetness of the Middle East, honey and dates, pistachios and cinnamon. The counters were crowded with pastries and the pans wide and brimming with baklava, katafi and barazak. The baker, a middle-aged man from Syria, called to us offering a taste of everything that he baked. He would not take no for an answer as if somehow by giving us something to hold on to from his country, he would not have to let go. Wanting the very same thing, we said yes. Besides, when offered this kindness, no is never the answer. Near the gates of Shatilla, a man sat on a stoop. On the tips of his fingers, he, sun, he spun a fidget spinner. It was green and red, black and white, of the colors of his country. He has never known. Palestine. He never let it slow, never let it stop, not even when his daughter, perhaps three, maybe four years old, came and went from underneath his legs, laughing and dancing between the shadows and the sun. His hair, long hair was pulled back in a ponytail and he wore a baseball cap of some faraway team. Around his neck, he wore a golden pennant in the shape of Palestine, so close to his heart as if it was his heart, his, his heart itself. How heavy it must have hung. We sat there with him on these small stairs as he told his life of his life in Chatilla. He works when there is work and studies in his free time. Aloud, he wondered why it is that he is even learning to speak English. It is of no use to him in this refugee camp except for conversations such as this. He closed his eyes and held his breath, searching for words that would not come. When he opened them again, he watched as his daughter ran down the street to play with her friends, telling us of a fear that she may never know what it is like to grow up in any other place but a refugee camp. She may never, not ever, know peace. His eyes filled with tears as he said this, but he wiped them away before they fell. I wish I could have caught them, held them, lied to him, and told him that everything was going to be all right. But we left him there on the stoop with tears still in his eyes that did little, little to blur the truth of his life. Stealing a glance over my shoulder, I saw him still sitting on the edge of the step, staring at his fidget spinner spinning it higher and higher until all the colors melted into one. When it finally fell, he did not pick it up. He only stared into a distance, just out of reach. Past the gates of the refugee camp, we took another bus across the crowded city. Merging into traffic, the door to the van slid open. It had never really closed, and for what remained of the ride, I stared into the empty space, wondering what a difference there is between leaving and being left behind.